two quick things on behalf of the White House Correspondents Association. Please First do. of all, we want to thank you for letting the entire pool in yesterday for the Secret Service event. Good. And we hope that... Uh, bet you enjoyed it. We hope it rubs off on Mr. Carney when he returns to the podium. <laughs> Uh, secondly, pass that along too. <laughs> <laughs> I mean that. Well. Yeah, he, he deserves as much credit for getting in there as I do. Thank you. Uh, media people come and go, and we don't always get to acknowledge that. We don't get to acknowledge the men and women who work behind the cameras as well. And I just wanted to very quickly thank you for letting us uh, thank Mike Green, a cameraman at CNN, who's retiring, and to be fair and balanced. A Fox White House producer, former producer, Dave Schott, left us yesterday after 17 years. And he's going to the NFL Network, which is a very cool job. Great. But Mike has been here for 25 years. Yeah. Well, just Obviously, I didn't have the sense to leave. <laughs> Number of presidents, five. Miles flown on Air Force One in the press charter, probably hundreds of thousands. And having cheese on the charter. Priceless. Yeah. So, I wanted to say thanks and I want to yield to the gentlelady from CNN who wants to say great. Mike has been looking forward to this day since we got here. He's been counting <laughs> down. Uh, every day might be State of the Union Day to us, but it was 52 days till retirement for Mike. You always have a great attitude to make us look great, and thanks to everybody for your indulgence on this. Thanks a lot coming from the likes of you. <laughs> Congratulations, Mike. Thank you very much. Um, I've got two quick things I wanted to do at the top. Uh, later this afternoon, delivering on a promise from his State of the Union address, President Obama will sign an executive order creating a Presidential Commission on Election Administration. As you may remember, the commission will be chaired by Bob Bauer and Ben Ginsburg. Uh, who, among other leadership roles, served as the general counsel for the President's re-election campaign and the national counsel for Governor Romney's campaign, respectively. Uh, we thank them for the hard work they've already dedicated to this effort and for the hours and experience they'll donate to ensuring its success in the months ahead. The executive order will direct the Commission to submit a final report to the President within six months of the Commission's first public meeting, uh, and it will also uh, ask them to consider a variety of ways to shorten lines and promote the efficient conduct of elections. That report is intended to serve as a best practices guide for state and local, elected, for state and local election officials to improve voters' experience at the polls under their existing election laws. The President also continues to support legislative efforts in Congress to improve the voting experience, make voter registration easier, and increase access to voting for all Americans. I know that uh, after the State of the Union address, many of you were interested in uh, how this process would advance, and we'll have uh, it will advance this afternoon when the President signs the executive order. Uh, as usual, we'll distribute the text of the executive order after the President has signed it. Uh, it will be later this afternoon. Uh, not this time. Batting average is dropped. Uh, the second thing I wanted to announce, I know this is something that we discussed quite a bit yesterday, about the day that the budget would come out. I know so many of you plan your social lives and professional lives around this. Uh, the budget will be released on April 10th uh, of this year. So let's get the countdown clock started on uh, the appropriate networks. Uh, with that, Josh, I think I've exhausted all of my announcements, so we'll let you start with the questions. Thanks a lot, Josh. Uh, this morning, the President, in remarks on gun control, seemed to be focusing really specifically on background checks, speaking about the broad level of support that he says it uh, receives, and urging mem uh, Americans to ask the members of Congress specifically to lobby on that issue. Has the White House shifted its focus to background checks as the most attainable of the gun control measures that you'd like to see happen? Uh, I, it is fair for you to uh, it, it is fair for you to believe, Josh, that the President remains firmly behind. Uh, the range of legislative proposals that he offered up uh, in mid-January when he gave uh, some remarks uh, on this issue. As you'll recall from that January speech, the President uh, initiated 23 separate and specific executive actions that he could do and his administration could do unilaterally to try to uh, put in place some policies that would reduce gun violence. Uh, at the same time, he rolled out a whole set uh, of legislative proposals that he would forward to Congress. Uh, and he vowed to encourage Congress to act on those proposals. He's making good on that promise, and that's what part of today's event, that's what, that's what today's event was about, was ensuring that Congress understands that the President uh, and his commitment to these issues has not waned. Um, it is clear from some of the public polling that the President cited 
that there is a, a lot of bipartisan support all across the country for the common sense proposals that the President's put forward. There's also a lot of support among gun owners across the country for the proposals that the President's put forward. We now just need to see some bipartisan action in Congress to get it done. And he spoke this morning pretty emotionally about not wanting to forget about the victims of, of Newtown. Mm -hmm. Uh, and said, sh shame on us if we do forget. Is, is he concerned that the moment to act on gun control has, is slipping away? No, he's not concerned about that. What he's concerned about is he's concerned about making sure that Congress understands that there is strong support all across the country for common sense measures that both respect the Second Amendment, but also will take important steps, make important uh, uh, progress in reducing gun violence in communities across the country. Uh, you know, these steps include a whole range of options everything from proposals that would improve uh, mental health services in communities, things that would, measures that would improve uh, school safety, but also some measures related to gun ownership, things like closing the uh, loophole in the background, loopholes in the background check system that you referred to earlier, but it also means uh, keeping military style assault weapons off the streets uh, of our communities. It also means cracking down on people who so-called straw purchasers, essentially people who walk into a gun store and purchase a gun with the express purpose of providing it to somebody who shouldn't, uh, who wouldn't otherwise be able to purchase that gun themselves, uh, and also putting in place tougher gun trafficking laws to try to crack down on gun violence uh, in, in this country. So uh, the President remains, uh, as you pointed out, passionate about this. Uh, and I think that you'll, uh, you can anticipate uh, that you'll hear more from the President on this in the uh, days and weeks ahead. Can you tell us a little bit about what we'll see this afternoon when the President meets with African leaders? Uh, I can. Um, the President uh, has been looking forward to uh, this meeting for quite some time. Um, uh, today's visit is an opportunity uh, for the President and for the United States to underscore our support for Sub-Saharan Africa and for democracy. Uh, as, he, as he has in the past, the President is inviting these leaders here uh, because they represent a side of Africa that is too often overlooked nations that are making impressive progress uh, and can serve as a positive model for democratic development across the region. Uh, some of the things that they'll cover in the context of this meeting would include uh, strengthening support for democratic institutions uh, in these countries, but also in countries throughout sub-Saharan Africa. Uh, they'll also talk about the, the, uh, the need and the, uh, the potential that these countries have for expanding growth and trade uh, and investment in their countries. That certainly promotes some economic opportunity in this country as well. Um, they'll also talk about some strategic issues in terms of how we can advance peace and security uh, in these countries, but also throughout the region. Uh, and we'll also talk about some development uh, opportunities that would, um, that would help these countries continue to make progress uh, in strengthening the uh, economic infrastructure uh, of those countries. Can I follow okay. that? Since I asked it yesterday. Sure. Thank you. Um, Josh, when you're talking about development issues in Africa, um, is the issue of China coming in, into play? Because there's been a concern for many, many, many years that infrastructure in Africa and many of the countries in Africa has been built by the Chinese in exchange for oil. And uh, uh, Secretary Kerry has said that this is a major concern about China and Africa, uh, you know, just in recent weeks. Is that going to be one of the topics in, in the... Uh, well, I don't want to get ahead of the meeting, and there will be a pool spray with the entire pool, Mark. Uh, where the president will talk about <laughs> it's it's improving we're, we're back on the upswing here uh, but the president will have the opportunity to talk about the conversation that he does have with the leaders of these countries and uh, I don't I don't know frankly whether or not China will come up in those meetings uh, uh, but the president will have the opportunity to talk about that what I can assure you is that the president uh, is looking to strengthening the relationship that we have with these countries uh, that there is an opportunity for us to build stronger economic ties between our countries and between our country and theirs, uh, that would promote economic growth both in their country and in ours. Uh, the, these strong ties also are helpful in helping these in supporting the democratic institutions that these countries are struggling uh, to build and to capitalize on the progress that they can make, uh, and to ensure that they can actually serve uh, as a foundation of peace and stability. Uh, in a region uh, that um, isn't always known for its peace and stability. So will Secretary Kerry also do a drop by because it's, he's having a meeting directly after uh, the meeting with the African I, I don't know the logistics of Secretary Kerry's schedule today. We can look into that for you or you can check with the Department of State. Okay. Josh, did you have anything else? I didn't mean to interrupt you. Okay. Jeff? Thanks, Josh. Um, United States flew two stealth bomber practice missions today over South Korea. 
What uh, message is the United States trying to send with those flights? <clears throat> well, as you know, Jeff, the uh, United States uh, has been working with our ally, allies in South Korea uh, on a, a range of military exercises that are defensive in nature. Uh, we do these exercises on an annual basis or so. Uh, this exercise uh, today, or at least in the last day or two, uh, has uh, included in this case um, some, ex some uh, exercises uh, that involved uh, B-2 bombers. Um, you know, the, what we have said uh, for quite some time now, in the face of the bellicose rhetoric and threats that have been emanating from the North Koreans, is that we stand shoulder to shoulder with our allies in South Korea to ensure that, their, that, the, that the interests of the United States and the allies of the United States remain protected. Um, and that is, uh, that is something that should be uh, evident from the comments of senior administration officials, but should also uh, be evident from the close security cooperation that we have with the South Koreans, including these recent military exercises. And on a separate topic, the President is going to Florida tomorrow. Mm -hmm. uh, you said before that he would be talking about the economy. Can you give us any more sense about what the message will be tomorrow? Mm -hmm. I do have a couple of thoughts on that. Uh, as you know, the President believes that even as we pursue balanced deficit reduction, we need to make smart, targeted investments to create jobs and boost our economy. One of those investments that he discussed in his State of the Union address is the need to put Americans back to work, back, uh, is the need to put Americans back to work right away, building the infrastructure that American business and that American workers need to compete and win in a global uh, 21st century economy. Tomorrow at the Port of Miami, the President will continue to flesh out uh, some, uh, some, of the, his de some of his detailed proposals to do just that. The Port of Miami is a major center of commerce, an example of the critical infrastructure improvements uh, that are being undertaken uh, to remain competitive in the global marketplace, using the types of combined investment from the federal government, state government, and local government, and private investors uh, that the President has called for. So this is a, a good opportunity for the President to illustrate uh, the value, both in the short term and the long term, uh, of the important infra infrastructure investments that the President's talked about for quite some time. So will there be new proposals, or is it just a follow-up from proposals he's already made? Uh, well, stay tuned. I think that we'll, we've got a couple of tricks up our sleeve for tomorrow. Okay. Good. Bill. Is the President relying just on the bully pulpit for gun control, or is he actually calling any of the uh, members who are at over their districts right now? Uh, I don't have any specific presidential calls to read out to you, but uh, over the course of the last several weeks, the President has been in touch with a number of members of Congress in the House and the Senate, Democrats and Republicans, uh, to talk about a range of the President's legislative priorities. Uh, it should be evident from the President's passionate remarks today about measures that could reduce gun violence in our communities uh, that that is a legislative priority of his. So uh, the President uh, did indeed talk about uh, his support for some of these proposals and did uh, uh, encourage members of Congress to take a close look uh, at these specific proposals that the President has offered, uh, both because we should be able to find bipartisan common ground around proposals that would uh, uh, demonstrate or that reflect the President's uh, commitment to protecting the Second Amendment, but also reflect the President's commitment to finding measures, common sense measures, that would reduce gun violence in our communities. But will he do it personally as well as through the media? Uh, I would anticipate that the President will have additional conversations with members of Congress as uh, these measures uh, make their way through the legislative process. How does he feel about Mayor Bloomberg's effort to stimulate the gun control in various key districts? Mm -hmm. I haven't had a specific conversation with him about this uh, political campaign that uh, Mayor Bloomberg has undertaken. Uh, I can tell you as a general matter that, uh, as you heard, I, you know, I, I think the President was pretty unequivocal about uh, this in his comments today, that there is strong support all across the country for the common sense measures that the President has put forward and for some of the measures that are going to be considered in the Senate uh, in the next couple of weeks. Uh, and he was pretty candid about encouraging members of Congress or about, about citizens to contact members of Congress to encourage them to support these proposals. And if there are others across the country who want to make a similar appeal to citizens to contact their members of Congress, uh, and encourage them to support these common sense measures, the President certainly welcomes that. So he wouldn't object to what Mayor Bloomberg no, is doing? No, not at all. And one other question. Is he going to throw out the first pitch somewhere? <laughs> That's a good question. Uh, I, I haven't seen that on the schedule yet, but uh, if we add that, we'll let you know. It certainly sounds like a lot of fun. Uh, why not? <laughs> Josh, on, uh, Take Bill's the pool, will you? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> we will. 
On Bill's question about guns, um, obviously we should note that Republicans are threatening a filibuster in the Senate, and most Republicans in the Senate and House are talking about opposing a lot of these gun control measures. But as you know, there's a core group of Democrats in the Senate, maybe about a dozen or so, who, you know, when the President said today some people are getting squishy, that includes some Democrats as well. In addition to the calls that he might make that Bill was talking about, and, and the targeting that Mayor Bloomberg is doing of, of Republicans and, and whatnot, uh, are there Democrats the President's going to call out and say, look, you've got to come along here. This is an important issue for me. Uh, I'm confident that the President will be speaking to both Democrats and Republicans about his strong support for these proposals. Uh, as I mentioned, I think the President mentioned this in his remarks as well, that if you take a look at some of the polls that have been conducted, not just, the, not just polls of members of Congress, but polls of Americans across the country, that there is very strong support for many of the initiatives that the President has put forward. The closing loopholes uh, in the background check system is probably the best example of this, that there are a, a couple of polls I've seen now that demonstrate that 90 percent of Americans uh, support closing loopholes in the background check system. And those aren't just Democrats that, that, that these polls are, are surveying. These polls include Republicans, about 86 percent of Republicans in a recent poll. Uh, are supportive of efforts to close loopholes in the background check system. And the other thing that I think is notable about this is that those polls also, these polls also include uh, surveys of gun owners. And 86 percent of gun owners uh, actually support closing loopholes in the background check system. So there is a, there is, you know, the President and his spokespeople often will talk about the need to find common ground. It is not hard to find uh, common ground on this issue. It is clear that the American people agree that, for example, closing background checks uh, is a pretty good place to start in terms of common sense measures that would reduce gun violence. On the issue of common ground, on guns, he wants that. He says uh, on immigration reform, he did these interviews yesterday, yesterday saying he wants bipartisanship. Um, and uh, he's having dinner with Senate Republicans, we hear, in a couple of weeks to mm -hmm. talk about a grand bargain again. Mm -hmm. If he wants to. Well, I, I, I think he'll cover a range of his oh. legislative priorities in that dinner. So I wouldn't be surprised, I mean, I guess uh, to Bill's question, I wouldn't be surprised if the, if, uh, the President's support for some of these common sense measures uh, to reduce gun violence does actually come up at the dinner. This is something that is a legislative priority at the President's, and I'm confident that will come up at the dinner. Now, I, uh, you know, I, I think at the same time the President is very interested in having this dinner because he's looking forward to the opportunity to hear from these, these, uh, these senators. So uh, they'll, have a, they'll have a healthy conversation, but it will include uh, some of these common sense measures to reduce gun violence. The question is he wants to have that healthy conversation. He wants bipartisanship on all of these issues, and yet we hear next week he's going out fundraising back on the campaign trail. Uh, to help elect House Democrats for 2014. When Jay Carney was asked about this a couple weeks ago, I think there was a Washington Post story saying the President was going to be focused on 2014, uh, putting Nancy Pelosi back in as Speaker, and he said, no, no, that's not his focus. And here we are, beginning of April, mm -hmm. way before the 2014 election. Why is he going fundraising already? Well, the President has some responsibilities as the head of the Democratic Party uh, to support other Democrats. I don't think that's particularly surprising. Uh, and I don't think that the President views uh, those two activities uh, as being in conflict. Uh, there is an opportunity for the President to try to build common ground in Washington, D.C., to advance his agenda. Uh, and, you know, whether it is uh, measures that, measures like closing loopholes for background checks that have strong bipartisan support. We're seeing bipartisan support for some of the immigration proposals that are being discussed in the Senate right now. Uh, there's even some pretty good bipartisan support around some of the budget proposals. Now, that hasn't necessarily yielded prompt legislative action, but there are Republicans who are sending signals that they agree with the President's balanced approach, or at least willing to consider it. So uh, it is certainly possible for the President to continue to move forward in a bipartisan fashion on a range of his own legislative priorities while fulfilling his responsibilities and his uh, support uh, for Democrats in, uh, in elections. I think the thing that's notable about this, and I think you alluded to it in your question, uh, these elections are uh, almost two years away, or at least more than a year and a half away. So there's no reason we need to get wrapped up in uh, discussions about uh, about elections. We, there's plenty of work to do here in Washington, D.C. Uh, before we turn our uh, attention to the midterm elections. Very la uh, last quick thing. Um, he's meeting with the African leaders you mentioned this afternoon. Just came back, obviously, from an important foreign trip. Mm -hmm. uh, Gallup had a survey uh, earlier this month that surveyed citizens in 130 <coughs> countries, and they found that median approval of U.S. leadership around the world has declined by eight points from 2009 when the President took office down to 41 percent, the lowest of his presidency. He obviously made a big deal in the 2008 campaign saying, I want to restore America's standing in the, in the world. Why then do you think it's still in a pretty low standing right now? Mm -hmm. uh, I, haven't, I haven't seen that poll. I, the thing that I would say is I think that there is plenty of anecdotal evidence that uh, American leadership uh, on, uh, President, uh, on President Obama's watch uh, has strengthened significantly. Uh, I think that was evident anecdotally in the speech that the President delivered in Jerusalem, uh, the reaction that he got from a, 
uh, a crowd of Israeli citizens, I think was really powerful. Uh, and I think that that was uh, reflected in some of the coverage from those remarks. You know, the president has an upcoming trip uh, to, to Mexico and Costa Rica uh, at the end of next month. Uh, and that will be an opportunity, for, again, for him to talk about how uh, we can strengthen the ties between the U.S. Uh, and Central America, that there are important people-to-people uh, -people ties, that there are a lot of uh, immigrants to this country from that originated in Central America, so that there are strong cultural and, 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 and individual ties. Uh, there are also strong economic ties, uh, and that there is an opportunity for us to build on that relationship in a way that strengthens the economy here in the U.S. So there is an opportunity for the President to demonstrate his leadership in the international community in a really important way, uh, and I think that it has been enhanced over the course of his presidency. May I okay. call on the dinner? Mm -hmm. Sure, Jessica. Um, what work is the president doing in between these two dinners to build his relationship with Republican senators? Mm -hmm. Well, uh, I, again, I don't have any specific conversations or calls to read out to you, but the president has certainly demonstrated, I think, over the course of the last several weeks in particular, his interest in trying to build uh, a rapport, uh, even if it's just socially, with, uh, with members of Congress, rank and file members of Congress. Uh, and. Uh, the President's hopeful that that can lay the foundation for constructive dialogue and progress on a range of legislative priorities. So I, we haven't seen that yet. But, you know, this is, a, this is a process and an effort that I think should be judged over the long term, and I think that I think you'll do that. Okay, so to dial back and try to come out in a different direction, okay. is the White House laying groundwork in between these two dinners to try to get something concrete out of the next dinner? Uh, I wouldn't anticipate a specific uh, agreement or a uh, and avail in the lobby of some uh, restaurant uh, here in Washington uh, to announce a, a bipartisan agreement on something. Uh, again, I think these are, you know, that the, 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 the dinner that the President had at the beginning of this month and the, the dinner that he'll have at the beginning of next month uh, are an opportunity for him to lay the groundwork for future agreements. Uh, and I think that this is, um, you know, this is something that I, I know I've been asked about previously and I know that, uh, that many people lament the deteriorating uh, social relationships uh, between senior figures in Washington, D.C., that, that previously uh, that there have been, uh, you know, that some people have speculated that personal relationships have been uh, important to bipartisan agreements. Uh, I don't think anybody, and I don't think even the people who are asking me the question were thinking or were suggesting that just showing up at a cocktail party was going to be the difference between getting a bipartisan agreement and not. But we're hopeful, and the President is hopeful, that by establishing a, uh, that by establishing a, a, a useful rapport, um, can be helpful in fostering constructive dialogue uh, down the road. Now, the other thing I think that the President has found interesting about this process is he has found it helpful to hear directly from these members of Congress about their priorities and their perspectives on some of these things. It's a helpful dialogue to try to find some common ground. I think many, many members of Congress have expressed a similar view, that there were positions that the President has long supported uh, that they weren't aware of. And so if this is an opportunity for them to uh, you know, put aside the posturing uh, to do so uh, without having to worry about uh, the prying eyes of the media, uh, but to actually have a private conversation about their priorities uh, can be useful to finding common ground moving forward. Uh, again, I don't think that's something that's going to happen right away, and there's certainly not going to be a, uh, an avail right after the dinner to announce a historic bipartisan agreement, but we're hopeful that it's uh, useful in laying the groundwork to, a, to, uh, to more bipartisan cooperation in Washington, D.C. Should we make something of the fact that it's also on April 10th, the day you say the White House is releasing its budget? <laughs> Just a happy confluence of, uh, of events. All right. Peter. Josh, if I can follow up on guns, and as long as we're on the topic of statistics in terms of the number the President cited, I think it was 9 out of 10 Americans saying, for the stat you cited, mm -hmm. they support mm -hmm. uh, expanded background checks. But there was another series of statistics that came out, I think, earlier this week from our colleagues at CBS, thank you, Bill, for those, that say that support for stricter gun control laws stands at 47 percent today versus 57 percent, that it's dropped 10 percent in barely 100 days since Newtown took place. And while the President said, shame on us if we have forgotten, and that these families he stood with today haven't forgotten, isn't there some responsibility of this White House not to have acted, notwithstanding 20 events in 100 days, to have done more while that window of opportunity existed? Mm -hmm. I think the President did move really quickly after the tragic events of Newtown to uh, try to uh, uh, advance the discussion about common sense measures to reduce gun violence. Uh, the President acted unilaterally, as we discussed. Uh, you know, on the day that the President rolled out his proposals in mid-January, he announced 23 executive actions 
that his administration would take unilaterally to put in place some measures that could contribute to a reduction in gun violence. Uh, the Vice President has been very visible on this, uh, on this topic, as we discussed a little bit yesterday. Between the President and Vice President, uh, they, devoted, uh, uh, they devoted their time to about 20 uh, different interviews and events and other public appearances to encourage Congress to take action. And I think, you know, because of the, the support that's cited in the poll for a number of the proposals that the President's put forward, I, I think that you can judge those uh, events as uh, very constructive to this process. But again, this, we're not stopping here. You know, the use of the President was demonstrating a pretty clear commitment to uh, continuing the effort on this. Um, and uh, this will actually continue into next week. On Tuesday, uh, the President will travel to Denver, uh, where he'll continue to ask the American people to join him in calling on Congress to pass common sense measures to reduce gun violence. He'll meet with local law enforcement officials and community leaders to discuss the new measures the state has recently put in place, including closing back including closing loopholes in the background check system to keep guns out of the hands of criminals and others who should not have access to them. So, you know, the President started on this very quickly, uh, and our efforts on this will continue uh, forcefully. So given all those efforts, and it seems, as you indicate, a lot of emphasis on this, including what's going to happen on Tuesday, still, at least from these stats, and you cited some stats earlier today, 39 percent of Americans say they want laws kept the way they are. 11 percent say they want them to be less strict. That means that 50 percent of Americans, <coughs> even after all the emphasis the White House and, and Joe Biden, the Vice President, has put on this, that Americans, it seems, disagree that new laws are needed. Well, I, I think that this, uh, you know, the, the numbers that you're citing and the numbers that I've cited are an indication that a lot of these are, are, a lot of these policy decisions that need to be made are complicated, that they, that they reflect uh, difficult questions, or at least complicated questions, not necessarily difficult ones, but complicated questions related to heritage, related to the rights guaranteed under the Bill of Rights, uh, but also related to what are, uh, to broader societal Challenge the challenges that we face in terms of trying to keep our community safe. But the President has been resolute about challenging Congress to take action and not allowing them to suggest that because these things are so complicated, we shouldn't take action. The President has said, if w there's one thing that we can do that will make one child safer, then why wouldn't we do it? Following up very briefly on a different note, last week while we were traveling with you and with the President when he was overseas, he said that the use of chemical weapons by the Syrian regime would be viewed as a game changer. Today we learned about a series of new attacks, these by rebels against the Assad regime, where I think at least 10 people were killed there. But the President said that the investigation was basically still underway to determine whether the use of chemical weapons existed. So where do we stand mm -hmm. on that and how much longer do we wait to find out what actually happened? Mm -hmm. Well, you referenced the uh, mortar attack that took place in, uh, at Damascus University today. Uh, we've noted the increased tempo in clashes in the Damascus area. We're deeply concerned by the reported mortar attack uh, on a Damascus University faculty of architecture building today, which resulted in reportedly at least 10 deaths. We cannot confirm at this time who is responsible for the attack, uh, but we've been clear in our insistence that all sides should abide by international law, including not deliberately targeting citizens. So that's an important part of this. The second thing is, is you know, the, the, the United Nations announced earlier this week uh, that uh, Mr. Selstrom of Sweden would head the UN fact-finding mission that will investigate allegations of chemical weapons use in Syria. Uh, the United Nations is continuing their efforts to compose the remainder of the team, drawing on expertise from the Organization for the Prohibition of Chemical Weapons and the World Health Organization. Uh, and we understand that they hope to begin their investigation within the next week. So we're certainly pleased to see the UN uh, moving quickly to work out the details. And it demonstrates the unique importance the United Nations is placing on the investigation. Now, this investigation is only going to be successful if the Assad regime uh, cooperates with their efforts to investigate uh, any and all credible allegations of the possible use of chemical weapons in Syria. So uh, we'll hopeful, we're hopeful that the Assad regime will cooperate with the with the group that Mr. Selstrom has pulling together. Thank you. Okay. Roger. Uh, you mentioned Denver next Tuesday. Mm -hmm. uh, is he doing that on the way to California? Uh, yes. Okay. All right. Uh, you said the Election Commission report will be six months after the first meeting. Do you have any sense of when the first meeting would be? Uh, I, I don't yet have a date for that, for that first meeting. I'll 
So you mentioned Colorado's gun law. There are, by some reports, more than 20 states considering laws going in the other direction to put up roadblocks to any limits on the Second Amendment. Is that on the President's radar? Is he at all concerned about that? Well, the, the, the measures that the President has put forward would not affect the Second Amendment rights of law-abiding citizens. That's, that, that is a, a priority of the President's as well. The President believes in the Second Amendment. So none of the measures that he's put forward would have any impact on the Second Amendment rights of, of law-abiding citizens. Let me rephrase. There are more okay. than 20 states that are considering legislation or pass legislation that would move in the opposite direction from the direction President Obama would like to go. Is okay. that concerning to him? Well, you know, the President is hopeful that we can uh, – that the Obama administration can work in bipartisan fashion in Washington, uh, and where appropriate to work with state and local officials about measures, again, that would reduce the impact or reduce the likelihood uh, of gun violence in communities all across the country. This is one of the reasons that we're going to Colorado to talk to law enforcement officials and other uh, elected officials in Colorado who have recently taken steps that would make their community safer there uh, in Colorado. Okay. JC? We know that the Secretary of State, Kerry, will be here this afternoon. Um, and we also know that he has been speaking to his counterparts in NATO, in the region, in the Far East as well as, as, well as the Defense Secretary Hagel. Um, how much of that meeting with the Vice President and President will the discussion of the provocative actions and statements from North Korea be, be, be a part? Well, I think you're referring to the regular uh, weekly meeting that the President has with him. We, we have made it a practice not to read out the details of that meeting. But suffice it to say that uh, Secretary Kerry has had a very busy uh, travel itinerary over the course of the last week. So I think they'll have a lot of things to discuss. The other, the other part of this, and I think uh, you could get more details on this from the State Department, but uh, the, the State Department, uh, senior officials at the State Department have been in regular contact with our colleagues uh, throughout Northeast Asia. Uh, to talk to them about the continued provocative acts from the North Koreans and the provocative statements from the North Koreans. Uh, you know, as I mentioned a little bit in the briefing yesterday, uh, our allies in that region have a significant stake in resolving those tensions uh, in a diplomatic way uh, and without violence. Uh, so I, I'm confident that uh, di our, our diplomats in the region and our diplomats here in Washington have been in coordinating with, with their counterparts uh, as we work through uh, a delicate situation there. Thanks. Okay. Yeah. Goyle. Two questions. Thank you. Uh, Secretary Kerry just came back from Afghanistan, mm -hmm. and uh, people of Afghanistan now asking, and they trust now President Obama as far as ending the war, and also what they're asking now, what is their future after U.S. or NATO leaves Afghanistan? Was Secretary Kerry carrying any mess carried any message from the President for the people of Afghanistan? Well, I think that might be a better question for the State Department because they. Uh, can give you more details about the conversations that Secretary had during his trip. But as the President has expressed many times, uh, that, the, uh, that the American people um, you know, want to continue to work with the Afghan people to help them build the democratic institutions that are going to be critical uh, to the safety and security and stability uh, of that country moving forward, even after uh, uh, the war has ended there. The immigration issue is concerned on the Capitol Hill, like you mentioned for the last couple of days, progress is being made there. Talking to the more of the Latinos and also illegal people in this country, now they have more faith and trust in President Obama than four years ago. What they are now saying is that time has come for President to bring them out of the shadow and working in bad conditions or low wages and all that. And they are willing to pay taxes and also whatever is needed, just like a good citizen. What they're asking now, really, what is their future now, immediate future? What message do you have for, um, President has for them, and also what message President has for the small businesses? Also well, impact on the immigration. Well, one of the tenets of the comprehensive immigration reform that the President is advocating is a clear path to citizenship for undocumented workers in this country. The uh, so what the you know what, what what we'll see in that reform package is a is that what the President would like to see and what the President is. Uh, feel strongly about is ensuring that there is a clear path to citizenship for them. Uh, the President also believes that uh, a top priority needs to be uh, continuing on the progress that we've made to secure the border. Uh, I talked a little bit yesterday about the extensive investments that have been made to secure our border there in terms of the 22,000 uh, personnel that's on the border, uh, the commitments that have been made in terms of technology, in terms of aircraft, in terms of building fences 
Uh, about 650 miles of, of fencing and walls have been built along the border to secure the border. That's an important part of uh, uh, comprehensive immigration reform as well. Uh, and I think this, you know, th this clear path to citizenship and these efforts to secure the border reflect a lot of the common ground that we're hopeful that we can find to find a bipartisan compromise to move quickly uh, on comprehensive immigration reform. Chris? A big hurdle uh, in this immigration issue because President um, Bush also had the same issue during his presidency and then President Obama, of course, has been following and is pushing this issue. Mm -hmm. Where is this big hurdle now because uh, this can bring the economy online as far as uh, illegal immigration is concerned? There are certainly obvious economic benefits that can be derived from uh, passing, from the passage and enactment of comprehensive immigration reform. That's one of the reasons that the President has made it a priority. Uh, you do rightly cite that in the past there has been, uh, there, there were some efforts to try to find bipartisan ground uh, around comprehensive immigration reform, but quite frankly, uh, Republicans lost their nerve last time. So we're hopeful that as we continue to move this process forward, we're going to find uh, constructive conversations with Republicans in Congress. So far, that's exactly what we're seeing. Uh, that's, in, that's encouraging to the President, it's encouraging to this administration, uh, and it's why we're hopeful. Uh, that we're going to find, uh, you know, as the President said yesterday, that we'll have comprehensive immigration reform done before the end of the summer. Chris? Uh, Josh, I just want to follow up on the oral arguments that took place at the Supreme Court this week. In the wake of those proceedings, is the President confident the Court will strike down Prop A and the Defense of Marriage Act? Well, Chris, it was uh, about a year ago that I was actually standing at this podium in this room where people were uh, warning of the terrible argument that had taken place before the Supreme Court in defense of the President's Affordable Care Act and people warning that the Supreme Court was poised to strike down uh, that uh, in a pretty decisive fashion based solely on the arguments that were made by the attorneys uh, and by the questions that were posed by the justices. Uh, those predictions uh, demonstrated how unwise it is to make predictions uh, about the outcome of Supreme Court cases based solely on uh, the arguments that are presented orally. So uh, I don't want to judge or prejudge or predict uh, what the Supreme Court's ruling will be when it's announced later this summer. Would the President welcome a ruling from the Supreme Court that would institute marriage equality nationwide? Well, again, I, I don't want to. I, I don't want to get into parsing. You know what? How the president would respond to possible decisions that are offered by the by the justices. So w when we get an announcement of a decision from them later this summer, uh, you can expect a, a reaction from us. Thank you, Chris. Yeah, Excellent. April, a second bite of the apple. Oh, well, thank you. Um, <laughs> um, how is it determined, um, what's the process within the White House of how it's determined when an administration official will go to the U.S. Supreme Court and sit in the court and listen to arguments? Well, I, I don't know that there's a formal process necessarily. This is obviously a, uh, an issue that the President has spent a lot of his own time thinking about, and I know that there are a number of senior White House officials who were um, uh, were uh, encouraging uh, of, uh, of the arguments that were being made uh, by the Department of Justice before the Supreme Court. So uh, it's not surprising that when you have a high-profile argument like the one, uh, like the arguments that took place on Tuesday and Wednesday of this week, that there would be uh, senior administration officials who've been involved in this debate uh, or senior attorneys at the White House who uh, are eager to see those arguments take place in person. So have they been to other of the, um, the days where there were other arguments for other uh, groups that they uh, strongly support. I know, there were, I know there were some senior administration officials uh, at the Supreme Court for the uh, Affordable Care Act uh, arguments that I mentioned earlier, but uh, I'm not sure if I have a, a complete listing of they the. Were involved in that. These were officials that were just sitting there listening to the arguments in support of. Uh, uh, I, it's it's my understanding that there were White House personnel who went to observe the hearings. Uh, or to observe the oral arguments uh, during the Affordable Care Act case last year as well. So I don't, I don't frankly know how common that is. Uh, Donovan? Hey, Josh. I want to kind of ask you once again on guns. Mm -hmm. uh, there was, uh, I think the CBS News poll was cited showing that public opinion has waned and uh, uh, the question was whether the President had moved quickly enough or if he has lost momentum. There was, he cited a political story earlier this morning. You like it when he does that, don't you? <laughs> Saying in, in that story, we noted that the Patriot Act was passed within 45 days of mm -hmm. September 11th, and mm -hmm. it's now 100 days. Couldn't he have done more sooner, or what, was it, what went into the decision to take it so methodically? Well, I, I think I would not agree at all with your description of uh, this process as methodical. 
I think what you've seen from this administration is an aggressive process to move quickly to build public support and to put together specific proposals, uh, proposals that the President could act on unilaterally in the form of executive actions, 23 different ones, uh, 23 different proposals, uh, but also a set of legislative proposals that were ported to Congress. As you'll recall, just three days after uh, the President appeared at the memorial service for the victims of the Newtown shooting. He stood at this podium with the Vice President right behind him, and he called on Congress to hold speedy votes banning military-style assault weapons, high-capacity magazines, and uh, an initiative to close loopholes in the background check system. That was something that the President did uh, less than a week after the shootings. So the President, I think, has been very forward-leaning in terms of the way that he's engaged in this process. And the reason for that, I think, is readily apparent to anybody who's in this room or in the East Room earlier today and heard the President talk about it. He's, pas he's passionate about these issues. He understands and has seen, tragically, how families have been ripped apart by violence like this. And it is the President's determination to see progress made on these issues. And he is going to, uh, he has already acted quickly to try to build public support, to try to find common ground in a way that both re respects the rights guaranteed by the Second Amendment of the Constitution, but in a way that will reduce gun violence in communities all across the country. These are common sense, sense measures. That's, again, that's reflected in the strong support that these measures have uh, among Americans all across the country, including Amer among American gun owners. So what we need is we need Congress to uh, reflect the will of the people who elected them uh, and act quickly on some of these common sense measures. Again, I, I, I don't want to stand up here, and I don't think even the president would stand here and say that these that these that this that there are any easy answers to the to the complicated policy questions posed by the spate of gun violence. But we can't allow that complexity to be an excuse for inaction. So are you saying that the complexity of the issue is why it's taking so long? I, 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 don't, I don't know why. I, I, again, I don't think it's taking really long. I think what we're seeing is we're seeing a president who has engaged in this process from the very beginning uh, and has demonstrated a sustained level of engagement uh, at a pretty high operational tempo to uh, marshal public support and encourage Congress to act. But again, the president has taken 23 executive actions that he could do unilaterally to try to address this problem. So the President has taken definitive action, and he took those actions about a month after uh, the, the shootings at Sandy Hook Elementary School. At the same time, the President laid out specific proposals that, co that required congressional uh, approval that would also uh, have an impact on gun violence in communities all across the country. The President has acted very aggressively, and the, the President's tempo uh, is sustained. He held this event today that I, I think many of you found interesting. Uh, it was a pretty persuasive message to people all across the country to make their voices heard uh, to their member of Congress on this. Uh, and you'll hear more from the President on Tuesday uh, in, a, uh, in a place that is powerful because of the legislative efforts that they've taken at the state level there uh, to act on these, uh, on these challenges. So again, we can't – Congress and others should not be in a position of suggesting that they won't act because it's too complicated. They can't – that's not an excuse. That is not a good excuse. Thank you, Jack. Yeah, I'll take one more. Thank you. Uh, leaders of Brazil, Russia, India, China, and South Africa met in Durban this week for a summit. Uh, what is the White House thoughts and views on the, the BRICS summit and the decisions they took to win the summit, including the setting up a developmental time? Uh, mm -hmm. Uh, I have seen some of the reports about this. I don't have in front of me a specific reaction to that, but I can consult with my colleagues at the National Security Council and see if we can get you a specific reaction to that. I just want to clarify one thing that uh, Amy uh, handed to me. I may have been a little unclear. The visit in Denver is next Wednesday, um, so I believe that um, – I know, I know. So let's just make sure we get this right before I, before I leave. So yes, it's next Wednesday, which I believe is – April 3rd. Do I have that right? Yeah. Let me check your calendar. So Wednesday, April 3rd, the President will be in Denver. Is the, budget really April 10th the budget is really, <laughs> really April 10th. I got that date right. One out of two isn't bad, right, Mark? John, more seriously, just before you go, on yes. the issue of Nelson Mandela, obviously, this appears yeah. like this is a more serious health issue than past visits he's had at the hospital. Has the President had conversations with Mr. Mandela recently, and how is he being kept apprised of his health? Well, I know that the, the President is um, – uh, has found 
President Mandela to be an inspiration uh, in his own personal life, but also in his professional career. Uh, the President had the opportunity to meet former President Mandela when he traveled to, to Africa as a senator, and I know that they've had phone, telephone conversations. Uh, the First Lady and, uh, the, and uh, the Obama girls uh, had the opportunity to visit Mr. Mandela in his home when they traveled to Africa just a couple of years ago, and I know that they found that to be a very powerful uh, visit for them. Uh, the President is being kept apprised of, uh, uh, of, the, uh, of, of, of the former President's health condition. And uh, certainly our thoughts and prayers go out to, uh, to the former president and his family. All right. Thanks, everybody.